My name is Ross Trabasi. I'm a senior software engineer here at Sencha. I've been here for about four years, primarily focused on uh, framework code. But today, um, I have the pleasure of talking about the modern tool chain. And when we say modern tool chain, we're not talking modern toolkit. We're talking the future of build tools, uh, the next, next level stuff. Uh, I'm going to preface this talk with uh, so future me with this camera can, and everybody here when you're watching later, everything I'm going to say here might change. Um, <laughs> I'm putting that out there right now. So if you guys are watching this in like a week and you're like, oh, that's not the thing, it might not be the thing. So it might not be the thing. We're going to get that out of the way quick. Um, out of curiosity, the, whoa, uh, everyone in the room, how many people are using uh, some kind of build tool? Let's start with command. Who's using command? Okie dokie, few people, all right. Um, anyone doing any uh, node-based build tool stuff at all? Kind of on your own? All right, a few, Ro rolling your own solutions, I'm imagining, something like that. Okay, cool. All right, well, we're gonna start um, with a little trip back, because this is a talk about the future, so we're gonna start a little bit back. I'm also curious, how many people have been developing for f five years or more? <laughs> Seven years, seven years or more. How many people with your hands currently up right now uh, were doing JavaScript for seven years or more? All right, well this is gonna be a fun trip for everybody then because we've all been here. Seven years ago, the iPhone 3GS was released. Uh, it had a 480 by 320 screen and it was the first iPhone to shoot video. It's fantastic, seven years ago. Uh, we had iOS 3 which introduced MMS support and um, this awesome feature called copy and paste that we finally got. <laughs> Android was pumping version 2.0, Eclair with its sweet ribbed background. And uh, it had just added HTML5 support to the browser. And funny enough, at the time, it was actually called just the browser. That's what it was. It's just the browser. Uh, the Nexus One was coming out in early next year. Chrome was pushing at version 3.0, uh, and it just added um, the video and audio tag. It's a big jump. Uh, these were the big browsers of the time. We had 40% uh, for Internet Explorer, 50% for Firefox. That's W3C school, so take that for what you will. Uh, Command was still about three years away from even being a thing. No one had even thought about it yet. Um, well, maybe it was thought about, but it was still three years away from being a thing. Sencha Touch was coming out with version 1.1, and it was really kind of the start of componentizing mobile web apps. Uh, Node.js was used for the first time at a conference uh, seven years ago, and uh, Flash was cool, so that was the thing. <laughs> All right, so moving past that, uh, no, sorry, seven years ago, JavaScript was a browser language. Lived in the browser, that's where we were with JavaScript. Where are we now? Well, it's a much different world, right? We have, we have a cool computer from Microsoft, so let's just talk about what that means. That's weird. So we have desktop, phones, tablets, smart televisions, even tiny microcontrollers and robotics platforms are running JavaScript normally. Like, that's just what they do. Every single thing here runs JavaScript in some way for an application. So times have changed considerably uh, for the world and JavaScript and developers. So um, where are we going at Sencha? So the next thing for us, what will be there? And wait, no, no. <laughs> it's not the right slide. This is the right slide. Where are we going? So these are the tools, the tools that we should focus on for the future of our build system. Um, we, like I said at the very beginning, none of this is finite. These are the tools that we think are the top right now. and as Don mentioned in his talk earlier, the lay of the land for tools in JavaScript changes like t nightly. Tomorrow we could come and find out there's a whole new cool kid on the block. But for now, this is what we think are the best tooling for bringing us forward from where we are now into the future world of JavaScript. And just real quick, we'll run over them. Node.js with kind of your flavor of package manager, that's going to be NPM or Yarn. We'll talk about all of these in detail. But uh, Webpack is going to bring in our module loading how we get um, JavaScript loaded into the browser. Not even just JavaScript, data, images, everything. Uh, Babel is gonna function as our transpiler, allowing us to write JavaScript how we want 
and then choose how we export it for different various browsers. Uh, Sentia, yeah, we're a part of this too. Um, we're going to make some build tools that deal with um, thoughts around how we structure things, how applications are currently, and how we're going to bring them forward uh, into the future. And Mondo repo, and now that I kind of look at it up on there on the screen, the yellowish text was a poor choice, but that says code name. So it's not, I don't know if it'll be Mondo repo, but we like it. It's kind of cool. We don't, get to, we don't get to choose. I'm just a developer. I don't get to make any choices in that. So first up is Node.js. Um, how many people have used it at all for anything? OK, so generally we know it's a runtime based on the V8 engine, right? So we can run JavaScript on our computers, right? Generally pretty cool. To complement those, we need, well, I don't know, yeah, we, we need them, package managers. Package managers allow us to share code and bring down uh, other people's small pieces of code and work together with them. Uh, probably up till a couple months ago, there was pretty much no contest. You use NPM, that was your package manager. And then Facebook decided that wasn't good enough, so they built something else, and it's called Yarn. Now, as we look at these two package managers, I don't want you to think, you know, oh gosh, I gotta go learn something else, or I gotta do something else. These are all still based on package JSON, and there's this, you know, Yarn doesn't change that. It changes how it loads things and how it deals with versioning of different things. Um, it adds some new commands and new things, but you don't have to go that way. This isn't a one or another choice. This is a at the time, what's going to be fast for what I'm doing choice. And we'll just take a look really quick at the kind of the differences. So as far as version management, when you're working with a big team of people, on NPM you have uh, an optional package called shrink wrap. This is going to allow you to lock down versions across your team. So everyone gets the same version wherever you are. Uh, the key word in there, though, was optional. This is optional. So not everybody has to do this. And it's a little hard to force everybody into this world. Yarn took that out of there. And every time you do an install, you're going to get a yarn lock file, and everybody's going to be on the same version. There's no way around that. Parallel versus sequential installations. Um, well, this is kind of a no-brainer, right? If you do a bunch of things at the same time, it tends to be faster. So yarn will install things in parallel. NPM moves in sequence from one to the other. Uh, bottom line, yarn is faster. It's also secure, more secure across teams with your versioning. Uh, but it's new. It's brand new, like months new. And it's untested. There's going to be bugs. NPM has been around forever. It'll install your stuff. You don't have to worry about it. But it's going to be slow. And how slow? Well, let's find out. So up here on the left, we have NPM. On the right, we have Yarn. And they're off to the races. Here we go. They're installing the same thing. NPM install. OK, Yarn's done. Uh, NPM's still going. And um, we're coming through the second time of Yarn. It's OK, it's done. So that's two for Yarn, uh, still zero for NPM. Yarn going again through. This looks like three for Yarn. Yeah. I think you're getting the point. Uh, that's four for Yarn, and NPM is still installing on its first one. Come on, NPM, you can do it, buddy. Nope, five times. Five times of the same install for Yarn to one time of NPM. Doing the same thing, putting packages on your computer, right? That's all we need to do. So if you have the choice, I would start playing with Yarn. It's you know NPM install, minus G, Yarn. Just start doing Yarn installs. Save yourself a few minutes every day. It's really going to help. Um, so package managers, this is how we're going to get our code together. This is how we're going to bring it all together. But the next thing is how do we load it? How do we get it in the browser? How do we bring all this together? How do we load all of the things, right? I'm going to get all of the stuff. And this is everything. I need my data, my images, my all the things that I need to load. And our choice for that is Webpack. And we looked at a lot of things. We looked at System.js quite heavily. We looked at um, gulp and grunt tools to try to put things in spots. But Webpack offered us um, a ton of customization. And uh, specifically, we're talking about Webpack 2.0. And I'll talk about why we're looking at that. It's currently in beta, um, waiting on docs. That's what we've been hearing. So that's our focus moving forward, is the, the latest version of Webpack. Webpack gets a lot of flack for being difficult to configure. So I'm going to show you guys real quick how to configure it kind of on the easy. There's really three things that we're interested in. Um, this is just a webpack.config.js file sitting on my system. And it's exporting an object, config object. Okay. First thing that we're interested in here is the entry point. What's my first file? Where do I start my scan? Well, app.js works for us. That's what we want. Start there, figure everything out from that point. The next little config here is, where does everything go? Once I'm done figuring out, where do I bundle everything and put it? Or chunk off into separate files and put them? Where does it go? Real 
pretty basic configurations here. The uh, next really amazing uh, config that Webpack offers is the resolver, specifically its aliasing feature. This allows us to map words and files however we want. So if I say import foo, I can come back to Webpack and tell Webpack, hey, anytime someone says foo, I really mean the file at uh, you know, slash this, slash that, slash whatever.js. That's what I mean. And then in anywhere in my project, I can use those words together. And we use this quite a bit um, in our concepts for the future of build tools. This is important. As Sentia developers, EXT developers, we're very used to being able to put code wherever we want, and command is able to rationalize that. In the node world, it's just not that easy. It's very locked down, and we need to be able to, um, to bridge that. So Webpack offers us aliasing, which we use quite often. Uh, the next big piece in Webpack is a loader. A loader is essentially a piece of code from NPM. Uh, it's kind of like a plugin, but there's another concept for plugins, so I'm not going to say that. Um, a loader will transform files as it comes through before they get bundled. So uh, you'll notice up there there's a test that's just a regex that says, okay, anytime you see a .js, I want you to funnel it through this Babel loader. And the query object there is essentially what stuff would you like me to send the Babel loader also? So essentially we're telling the Babel loader, uh, I want you to transpile all of the ES2015 modules to CommonJS. That's what I want you to do to any JavaScript file that comes through uh, this pipeline right here. So it's actually not that hard to configure Webpack. Those are our basic pieces. Now, the config itself is extremely expandable. You can take it in all sorts of directions. But generally, these are the pieces that we need to accomplish what we, what we need to. Um, the other reason we chose Webpack 2.0 is its tree shaking functionality. This is a big feature for us. Command um, kind of does this right now uh, in a different way. But tree shaking in Webpack works like this. It's, it's essentially, how do we get rid of the code that we're not using? How do I you know, get rid of all the stuff that I don't need in my application? And it works in two stages. The first is, as we go through the bundling process in Webpack, we're going to mark anything, anything that's exported, that was never imported. We're going to mark all that comment it out. We're going to get rid of it. And then when a minifier comes through your code, it's going to remove all the dead code because it was never exported. So those all get removed. And we could take a look at that in this real simple example. So we got two files, helper.js and main. And a helper exposes two methods. And main's going to bring in just one of those. As we go through the bundling process, you'll see how Webpack comments out harmony exports. The first one in there, it says, yeah, I'm a harmony export, but you need me. I'm for reals. The other guy says, nah, get rid of me. I'm actually never used. And then when the minifier comes through, this is what you end up with. All the things fell away that you never actually needed, things that you never imported. This is going to be a really powerful feature for us moving forward, being able to just sh shake out the things that we don't need based on um, analysis of your files. Now, just for your notes, I guess, uh, common JS modules can't go through this process. They don't work that way can't analyze them like this. So everything that we have to do with tree shaking needs to be done with ES6 module imports. That's why we've gone this way. All right, so as you can see here, we did some, some bundling. But the next big piece is the transpiler, and that's Babel. Babel is pretty much the top transpiler that's out there right now. Uh, we can dial it back or forward. You can choose, you know, I just I just want to transpile my arrow functions for some reason. I just want one little piece, or I want all the things, or I want everything into the future, or maybe you want to write your own. You could decide, I really love to write in Klingon, so I'm going to write a Klingon translator and Jav JavaScript Klingon, right? Why not? It supports ES2015 and beyond. You can write any of those things. Plug-in base, like I mentioned, you can roll it up or roll it down or write your own. Um, it has polyfills for new functionality. Uh, just remember on those, as uh, I don't know how many of you saw Don's session, but as he mentioned, uh, be careful with the polyfills and the transpiling. Um, you want to gauge what you're getting. Remember that what you write isn't what coming, what's coming out, so you want to be sure it's performant uh, for the targets that you're interested in. We're going to look at source maps and how those work in the demo, but the idea here is that you shouldn't have to debug transpiled code. You should look at the code you wrote. Right? That was another big essential piece. And the other nice thing about Babel is it's relatively easy to try. You could just kick it open in the browser here. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can type in ES6. And on the right, it does um, real-time transpile. So you can see what's, what's happening and kind of help yourself get acquainted to it. 
So let's take a look at demo. I'm going to try to do this. This is going to be um, interesting. So I got to move you over here. And I'm going to try to use this monitor as a monitor, as a real monitor. So in my Webpack demo, the first thing we're going to look at here is the Webpack config. Um, we're going to start here at the top, as I mentioned. Um, can you guys read that at all? Sweet. All right. Because I can't fix it, so <laughs> you guys will be stuck with it. So at the top, um, actually, if I zoom in, does it work on here? Oh, fantastic. OK, so at the top here, uh, AppJS is our entry point. Um, we're going to use some inline source maps. Again, these are all just configs from the documentation, but the ones we're focused on, we're going to start with AppJS. I want to build out to a build folder. We're going to skip the resolver for now. I'm going to come back to that. I'm using just two very basic plugins. The first one is for HTML. I want to generate an index file and inject the script into it. So I have a template. I have an index.html file out there. But take that, and then when you're done bundling, uh, put the JavaScript file in there for me, a lot like the microloader works uh, right now when we do production builds. And then at the bottom, you can see we're doing a Babel transform. I want to take all the preset from 2015, all the stuff, and transpile that. And then uh, let's just take a look at our app.js. So real quick in here. Whoa, that was a little too much zoom. Yeah, so you can see I'm importing another, um, well, it's, it is a class. I'm importing a class box from another spot. And if I hop over here and twirl this down, you guys can see that app view box, right? And I'm importing it with a relative path. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm importing it with a relative path. And um, after my constructor runs, I'm going to add a couple boxes. If you guys want to see box, it's not really all that important, but it's just another class that makes div and has a class name, and it's really basic. Nothing fancy in there. All right, so let's see how this all works. Um, if I open up my package, Jason, I want to show you guys I have two scripts that I've written. The first one is a basic build script, just runs Webpack. It's going to default to look for a Webpack config.js file, and it's going to run a build. All right. The other one is using Webpack's dev server, which is a really handy tool to make an in-memory server. So this is a really interesting concept, but no files ever get written to the system. It bundles your JavaScript, but keeps it in memory. And any time that you want to get it, um, it goes through this web server. So nothing ever gets written out to your system. And this works for any mapping or aliasing. The server itself handles that. You never actually have to build a development version for this. It's actually a pretty neat uh, little tool. And we're going to run that right now with our NPM script. So let's give that a shot. I'll bring this over here. And we're going to do npm run dev. Off it goes. See, yeah, that's just essentially a alias or a shortcut to Webpack dev server. And when that kicks up, I'll drag it over there unless it pops up over there. I'm not sure which one's going to run on. Ah, it's over here. OK, here we go. Come on. Come on, buddy. Here we go. Yep, OK, so there are our two boxes. It's a fabulous app. I know you guys are impressed. So. Let's take a look at how we would actually work with this app, though. This is what's important. Uh, let's say I want to debug that box class, that box class I made. So I'm going to go ahead and start typing box. And you'll notice that I actually have access to app view box. I can see the path right there. And this is the magic of source maps. I can click on that. I can see all the code for it. So I'll shrink this down. And if I wanted to, I can actually even come in and put breakpoints in my ES6 code and debug it right here. I can see all my ES6 code. Everything works. I'm debugging my code, right? Well, I'm sure the first thing you're going to say is, that's all well and good. But what happens when it doesn't work and it's not my code? It's the transpiler. How do I see what's going on? Well, in Chrome, that's very simple. You can go up to this little dot here and go to the settings. And if you need to, you can always disable source maps. So if we turn these off and we come back, and just for ease, I'm going to go ahead and in that box class, let's break somewhere. Let's just, let's just break right here. So we can see, and I'll hop back into my demo, and we reload, and it breaks, and now we're inside of main.js, right? That's our bundled, unsource mapped code. Get out of my face. Why are you not moving? All right, well, that's not an option, apparently. Can I shrink it? Nothing, nothing. OK. Well, trust me, the rest of the code's in here. You probably don't want to spend too much time inside this. It's not a fun world looking at transpiled code. But it's, it's accessible. You're not locked out. This isn't a black box you can't ever get to. You're able to get back to this code. But I don't like to look at it. So before I forget, I'm going to switch that back, because it would be uh, 
sad moment if I didn't. All right. Makes sense? Pretty simple, straightforward. Source maps, we're all with me. All right, cool. Source maps. Yep. OK, and also in the side there, we didn't really look at the code. We could have here in, the, uh, in this piece. But well, we could see it right here. So wherever it's doing that, that class function right there, that's Babel transpiling our classes for us. Obviously, we don't have classes through our transpiled version. So we're able to look at that here if we wanted to. But no one wants to look at that. So let's move along. Get out of here, debugger. And yep, I think that's it for that piece. So we're going to continue on to the next part of the problem. So OK, we've solved how we want to do loading. We can alias things and put things where I want. This is pretty cool. But we have another issue. And that is, how do we organize all of these packages and projects and repositories? How do we do any of this? Right? It's, let, let's take a look at the kind of lay of the land. Let's see what's out there. So this is currently the node structure, the NPM structure, the world as it exists right now. You have your app. You have a node modules folder. It has about 70 billion modules in it usually. App main, uh, you have a view in there. And let's say we have a package that we got. It's our magic sauce. We want that for our app. Right now, in order to use main.js, or sorry, for, in order for main.js to use magic sauce, we do something um, like this, you know, I need to get dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash packages blah, blah blah blah, and that induces massive rage in developers, right? No, we've moved past this. Especially as ext, EXT developers, this is not acceptable. All right, well, let's move along. So wait, all right, I'm not going to put it in my app. Let's just move it outside my app. I need to share the magic sauce with everybody, right? Everyone needs magic sauce. How does that look? Well, we all know the first option. Again, this is, oh, even better. Now it's not even in my app. Now it's somewhere else I get to deal with. That's horrible. What, what's the other option? The other option is npm link. What this allows you to do is say, OK, I'm going to go to my magic sauce. I'm going to link it, which puts magic sauce up in the global space of your computer. And then you go somewhere else and you say, OK, link it in here. All sounds well and good, except um, there's one word I just used there, and that was global registry. This is a horrible idea, right? As soon as we get more than five of these things, it's going to get disgusting. And what happens if I wanted something, a different version? And now it's in my global registry, and I'm out of luck, and it's just a huge disaster. Um, this is a big mess. And in general, it is a big mess. NPM works off node modules very well, but it doesn't work off anything else at all, really. I mean, relative paths are just messy, horrible to refactor. NPM link is globally installed. And can you imagine trying to share 20 global registry entries across your team in two different countries? This just sounds a horrible idea. Now, we weren't the first to discover that this is horrible. Other people have discovered the horrible. And they've built tools for this. All right? We're not the first. And the first one we're going to look at here is a tool called Lerna. And Lerna is a tool for managing multiple packages, exactly what we need. Right? We got a bunch of packages. We need to manage them. Lerna is a one-to-many situation. I have one repository with many packages that I need to, at some point, publish to NPM. But while I develop them, I need to work on them all at the same time. Right? Currently in Node, that's a nightmare. Right? I got to work on package number two, and then I got to NPM publish it or link it, and then I can test it for my other package. And if it breaks, I just got to keep going through that process. Right? I got to keep going back and forth. So let's look, uh, take a look at the Lerna structure. Lerna works like this. If you have a packages folder, packages is the name that Lerna allows you to use. Essentially gives you another folder that can have a list of uh, packages in it. The way it works is it shims the node modules folder. It makes a folder in node modules with the same name as your package, and it puts an index.js in there, and it says, OK, well, anytime someone tries to require me, go over here. That's actually where things are. And that sounds pretty good, but it also sounds really dirty, right? It's just, OK, so you got a fake folder with a fake file that points somewhere else. Is this, is this the world we've moved to? Yeah. It is. It is the world we've moved to. That wasn't so. But the benefit of all this, at the end of the day, the import looks like this. This is what I want, right? I want the magic from magic sauce, and I want folders. I want anything. I just want it by name, just like the rest of the world should think. Lerna gives you one folder, though. so. We call it, a, I think of it as a class path, but you can't add any other things to the class path. There's one. And you can't do things like this. 
Say I wanted to get to a file inside of magic sauce. I wanted to get to something a little deeper. Well, because of the way they're shimming things, I can really only get to one file. I can really only get to that index.js, the main file in there, which is kind of a, a sad moment. Now, other, now, like I said, this does work for a lot of people. We're going to take a look here at um, Babel. So I'm going to pull this over. This is currently the Babel repository. This is their packages folder. Anyone want to take a guess at how many packages are in this folder for Babel? I'll just slowly scroll down while you guys count. You guys got it? Are we almost there yet? Nope. No, we're not. So does anyone want to go back to the NPM link idea? Because that's going to work really good. There's about 107 uh, packages that they manage and have to push forward all at the same time and all have interdependencies and need to work together. And that's probably why these guys sat down one day and said, you know what, we got to build a tool called Lerna and make this uh, different. Lerna itself is not new either. You see this lovely comment, whoa, what's going on here? This is very different for the MPM world. But it's called a mono repo. And a mono repo is essentially what it sounds like, a single repository holding multiple packages. They have a list of pros and cons. There's really not many cons. It looks intimidating to have all those packages in one folder, but the benefits easily outweigh that. Being able to develop your code uh, collectively is, it should just be first class. I don't even understand how it's gotten here, but yeah, we need this to do um, everything. And we're not the only people to adopt it. Obviously, Babel has this, uh, React and Meteor, Ember, all of them are going with this kind of mono repo structure. Anytime you have to develop multiple things that you're thinking of putting on NPM, or maybe not, you just need them to work together, in the node world, a structure like this is going to save you, right? But it missed one big piece, right? All the packages in one folder, that sounds cool, but what if I have uh, two repositories and my teams are managing them separately, right? I got one team somewhere that has a repository, another team somewhere else, and they all have packages that, that work together and we need to release those as a company together, how do I manage repositories? And that is a big piece that um, the Lerna system has missed, the mono repo structure. So we saw this and we decided we needed to take it to the next level. So we took mono repo and we stepped it up to what we are now calling the Mondo repo. So this is Mondo repo. A step above with the extra D really kicks it up. So Mondo repo is a many-to-many -many structure. It helps you manage repositories and packages all through um, very simple package JSON entries and structure. All right, so we're going to show you guys how it works. Here's what Mondo repo looks like, similar app to what we were looking at before. App at the top, still got some node modules, and now I have a Mondo repos folder. Inside this Mondo repos folder is going to be any repositories that we would like to have in the project. Inside there can be collections of packages that need to be shared across different things. So for example, this app needed the magic sauce, but it also needed my company's core utilities that everybody uses that are off in their own repository. And we decided to make our my utilities a collection of packages so that someday we can participate in the insanity that is NPM package management. And we're going to put out an addinator and a subtractifier. We're going to have a package for every little thing we ever do, right? So that's our world. The package JSON looks like this. We add a Mondo object to it, and we had a little bit of description. We say, okay, this project is a Mondo repo. We say repo true, welcome uh, to the club. We add a uses clause in there, and that is repositories that are being used by this package. So magic sauce, I'd like you to get that from uh, GitHub Sencha uh, magic sauce with this branch. And my utilities, I'd like you to go out and get it from my personal my user repo. I'd like you to pull those down. So when you run the Mondo command line utility, Mondo install, against this package JSON, it's going to git clone those repositories into this structure for you and give you a nice structure for all of your project. Repositories can be a container of any number of packages, much like the Lerna structure. I can have one repository with 107 packages, if I like that. Or a repository can be, or sorry, yeah, a repo can just be a single NPM package. I just want to bring down three separate NPM packages, not in a packages folder, and I'm going to make them interrelate. Or maybe my top level application needs all of them. All right? This is how you'll write code clean and as it should be import from name, import from name, import from path, right? Path starting from name, 
right? We shouldn't have to do relative pathing. We are well beyond that piece. So there was a, I did click the, okay. Mondo Repo has Webpack in mind as a first class citizen. It's aware that it needs aliasing, which is a super handy feature with three lines of code. Mondo Repo will generate all the aliases for your project. Just say, okay, open the repo. It figures that out and say, give me all the package aliases. It will generate this exact thing for you. It'll say, okay, magic sauce, you're over here. Adnator, you're in this folder. Subtractifier, you're over here. And Webpack can use that to let you go ahead and write that import code that we had at the top. Real simple, you're never writing aliases for stuff like this. There's, you can add to them by just adding to this object, but you won't need to deal with it. The next piece is Node, right? Okay, this is great for the world of Webpack, but what if I want to make a Node module and I want to organize it like that? Well, the way um, Lerna took it was by shimming the Node modules folder. We thought that's not a good idea. Uh, we don't want to be adding files anywhere, and we need full pathing. So we went the route of actually shimming require itself. Mondo repo will do this on that first line of code right there. When you run import, we do an automatic shim, an automatic resolver. We go through, we get all the aliases for your project, and then any time, like in line two, where you were to require something, Mondo repo will check it first and say, do I know about Adenator? If so, here's the path. Otherwise, just go back along to the normal node require route, and it passes it right through. Again, this is for development. You shouldn't really be shipping something with a Mondo repo auto initializer at the top. And to help you with that, the CLI will automatically inject this piece for you. So if you do a Mondo run against any JavaScript file, we'll automatically shim require and we'll run your JavaScript as if those packages were true node packages in the node modules folder. And you don't have to worry about that piece. Everyone um, thoroughly confused? Good. All right, let's do a demo to make it worse. All right, so let's take a look at the Mondo repo demo. So in this structure, we'll start with package.json. And all we really care about here is the Mondo piece for now. So I have said this package is a, um, let's give it, give it a little pinch here for all those in the back. Um, this is a Mondo repo. I'll talk about what base does a little later. We'll skip over that for now. I've said uh, currently that the packages for this repo are provided in this folder right here. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Let's move to the uses. In uses, I said, okay, I'd like you to go get um, my company's shared uh, repository from this GitHub address right here. And that ends up inside the Mondo repos, my co-shared, which is matching that uses name right there. And then we can take a look at the package that would have been pulled down from Git. And inside here, you can see this one's very simple. It just says, all my packages, they're located in the packages folder. I'd like you to scan that folder for me. And if I twirl down this packages folder, you see I have a core. And this guy is purely just a node module. He has no mondoness, he's nothing. He's a scoped node module, right? just any other node module. And he just sits in here. And the idea here is that my app would like to work on with that core, but I'm developing them at the same time. I need to work on them uh, jointly, all right? So inside this app, we do have like a little application JS. This isn't really doing anything um, all that fancy. It's just creating a div and here in app.js, you can ignore all the disaster that's below line 11 and let's talk about what's going on at the very top. The stuff below line 11 is just normal code. What we're interested in up here is our imports. We're asking, this app to import two things that are just node modules. Bring in superagent, bring in socket.io client. I want both of those things. Those I npm installed, okay? I'd also like you to import that application JS from my app. Note that I use Mondo repo demo app instead of doing dot slash app slash application.js. I'm giving it a name. I'm also asking for an export that comes from the core. I'd like your image class, please, that came out of the core. None of these things exist in the node modules folder. Without Mondo, all of this would be just sadness, right? None of this would be acceptable. What makes all this come together is in inside our Webpack config, we go ahead and spin up Mondo and say, go figure out all the aliases around here. And down in the alias resolver, we say, use those aliases. 
So anytime someone says um, import from Mondo Repo demo app, that's this guy because that's his package name, right? Mondo Repo knows that. And it knows that from there, I can get to app application by going through the app folder. And again, I'll quickly touch on this base. That's what allows us to refocus Mondo. So when someone imports this package, I actually want you to go to the app folder. I don't want everybody in the world to have to say, import Mondo repo demo app slash app slash. There's no reason to do that. It's all in the app folder. So that's why the base is in there. So let's run this. Now, as I run this, I'm just going to say, everyone in here can go to this demo and you can try it on your computer. But <laughs> uh, we are all adult developers. I don't want to see anybody sending something to my screen that is inappropriate for the demo. All right? So we're going to start. Skull icon is mandatory for the demo. It's a constant reminder of the sad. What's, oh, great. Oh, it's running somewhere. Hold, please. We're running my previous Webpack demo. Yep. Can't run two things on the same port. Useless machine. All right, let's try again. All right, so if you would like to visit this, it is mondo.ngrok.io. Mondo.ngrok.io. And the game plan here is you type in a word, and it goes out, and it gets an animated GIF of that word. Again, all adults, we do not need to take this to a weird place, OK? Yep, yeah, now what do we got? Fantastic. I knew, all right, OK. okay. I do have power to delete something. I'm going to say this right now, so OK, fantastic. The point here is it's working, demo's working, everyone's able to participate, but the more important thing is that, oh wow, guys, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna leave this here for the rest of the demo. <laughs> We're gonna come back and see where this ends up. I've unleashed the internet on something horrible. So that's gonna be an interesting moment later on. All right. All right, guys, so generally, here's the, here's the gist of it. There's a lot of docs, a lot of info. Um, Mondo Repo is on NPM. It is something you guys can start playing with. If you're, re re refresh. If I don't refresh, Israel's going to punch me in the face. All right, Israel made all this. Um, it's fa Oh, my goodness, this is fantastic. Fantastic. All right, go here. There's documentation now. You can try it out. Um, start getting a feel for it. If you're developing any kind of node-related tools that might interrelate, this is going to help you um, immensely. And uh, to be honest, it's a tool we need. Uh, personally, um, as uh, we develop the future of the framework, it's going to be based on this. We're going to be adding features to it, stuff around um, GitHub committing, sending out things you know, back and forth. Uh, it's going to become a, a pretty useful tool, and uh, we're definitely pretty excited about it. So check that one out. I'm really fearing my Chrome browser right now. It's just in the back of my head there. All right, moving on, build tools. I'm going to go through this real quick because uh, I do want some time for questions. So we play in this game also. As Don mentioned, there are four things that we know we're likely going to develop as thin layers over top of, build, of Webpack or other tools. We need a scanner, an indexer, an optimizer, a compressor. Um, these are all important, but currently, how many people are just can't wait to uh, dive into the next version of EXT? How many people want to upgrade their app right now? <laughs> All right. How many people would raise your hand if I said, we'll help you upgrade your app? More? A couple more? All right, one more. <laughs> For you, I have the Upgradeinator. Now, sadly, I don't think we'll get to call it the upgrade nader. Um, but us on the engineering team will be pushing for the upgrade nader. And I'm not going to even spend that much time uh, talking about how cool the name is. I'm just going to show you guys how it works. So I have a ext62 app right here. Trust me, 6.2. It is a time of trust, my friends. 
day of trust here. So all I'm going to do is kick this open here. I don't need you anymore. I need you running, though, because i got to see those GIFs. All right, let's see. So um, I have an NPM script. I'll show you guys really quick. All it's doing is running a um, node file that we've created called the UpgradeNator. And one is the minimal, and the other is like full guns blazing at your app, all right? So we're going to start with npm run, ooh, ruin. Wrong <laughs> command, different command. Yeah, just like I practiced. All right, so we're going to do the minimum, and we're going to see what this guy does. I have this checked into uh, version control, so we're just going to look at the diff between before and after running this. So I'll hit up the version control here, and we're going to twirl this open. You'll notice app actually didn't change at all. These didn't change. This didn't change. Not much change. Construct, right? We needed the or gone. Too, much, too, much, too many ORs. So we stripped those off. And this is the minimum. This is really the minimum to get you in a good spot. Right? We've got to clean up the constructors because that word is just not OK. Just can't use that word. All right, let's, let's focus this thing full full blast, full upgrade nader. I seriously wish we had a like, crazy ASCII art explosion here, but we don't. All right, so we can take a look at what happened. We actually converted um, all of your necessary files to ES6 imports. We were able to properly figure out where they should come from. We were able to obviously clean up all the mix-in stuff. We were able to pull the construct or back into a construct. If we take a look at main, we can actually see that the configs got pulled out into decorators for you. You're pretty much there. You're in a good spot. And this upgradenator is only going to get upgradenatored more, right? So we're going to gradenate this until it can't be gradenated anymore. And this is the, the very beginning. Um, so with a tool like this, how many people would feel a little more excited about upgrading? Yeah. Still you? Good. We're on board. All right. So that is the Upgradenator. That is the tools, the lay of the land um, right now. I'm going to, I don't know why I'm doing this, but here, last slide. All right, that's the last slide. Oh, wait, we got to see. I got to see. Where are they? Oh, I minimized it, didn't I? All right. Okay. Oh, boy. Two dogs. More spinny things. Wow. <laughs> If this is a representation of how my presentation has gone, I'm, in tr I'm just going to get rid of that one. Get out of there, buddy. This one, too. I don't know. Oh, man. The dance one. Yeah, that's how I feel. OK. All right, guys. Oh, thank you for that. Keep that with me. Um, I have seven minutes and five seconds if anyone wants to raise their hand and speak at me. Um, well, TypeScript has much more strict requirements. And we looked into TypeScript, and we're certainly not, it's not out of the question. We will have a way for people to use TypeScript. That's on our plan. I don't know when that's going to happen, but we have to. It's used. The big problem with TypeScript is it requires types for every one of your files. And we're having a very hard time figuring out how we generate all of that for our framework for TypeScript, where Babel doesn't really require any extra pieces. If you just had ES5 code and wrote in a couple ES6 things, it can deal with that, that piece. So essentially, TypeScript is just a much bigger jump into their ecosystem, and Babel is an attempt to stay on the standards path. So Babel is more like it's, uh, more yes, it's, it's ECMAScript. It's all standards-based, so it's moving on standards. TypeScript is, is essentially its own language with transpiling. Right? Is it fair to say? Good. That's the man. So if I say anything wrong, he's got a buzzer. It just zaps me in the kidney. <laughs> Anybody else? In the way back. So, um, like, you know, you said, like, NPM and stuff like that. Would yeah. Get to a point where, like, the Git libraries would Unknown. Unknown at the moment about the EXT libraries. We do know that our plan is to get the build tools out there. We're trying to figure out how we distribute the, the framework for sure. We do know that there will be a way for you to get it if you don't want to play in the node NPM world. 
There'll be a way for you to get some kind of zip or executable that you can run. It gives you all the things you need, and you don't have to go that way. Um, but we are looking into how we can deliver via package managers. NPM is very uh, wild west. We can't authenticate. We, we can't do much as far as providing for people that have actually purchased something. Um, whereas uh, Yarn has actually opened up some potential for being able to put in our own stuff. So we might move to a Yarn-based distribution system. Yes? Yes, yeah. Uh, secure across your team. You can count on everybody getting the same version of a package, right? So in your NPM package, you might say, give my team uh, any version that's 1.2 or greater up to 2.0. Well, that's a big range. And you really don't want your team jumping between that. So Yarn is going to lock it down. So everybody's on 1.25 regardless across that. It will, but you'd have to step it up as a choice. You'd have to choose for your whole team to move that forward. Whereas right now, if you know, Bob does an NPM install two weeks later, he's going to get versions that maybe you didn't have when you installed a couple weeks ago. I don't think it has that, but um, there's a bunch. Again, there's a package for everything, so NCU will go out and check and give you a list of all the the latest packages for something. Anybody else? Yep. With command? All right, so command, as um, we saw in Don's uh, slide, we really have a split. Command 6.5 is going to exist as it does now with new ES6 support for existing stuff right as it is, and it may grow support over time for modules and more things. Build tools and NPM and all this is a new world of tooling. They're, they're separate worlds. Yep. Uh, I noticed uh, in your presentation, uh, there was an autocomplete on your bash prompts when you typed in. Yeah. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, it's a, it's a shell, it's a shell um, replacement called Fish, and it actually remembers every command I've ever typed and gives me autocomplete of my history, which is, it does that too. It does both. So as I hit tab, it completes what's there. And as I hit up, I can go back. So if I type NPM, I can go up through every NPM I've ever run. Yeah, fish. If you look up fish bash, you'll find it. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. I got the two minute curfew back there. Okay. Well, that's all I got. So if anyone wants to come up and ask me stuff, thanks a lot. <laughs>